Okay, I guess that's over to me. Okay, I'm going to, first of all, I'm going to introduce you. Okay. All right. And, okay, so we started our recording. So we, we are very fortunate to have two presenters today. They're both on the Editors Canada Certification Steering Committee. We have Anne Brennan, who's a certified professional editor. She's based in Vancouver, and she specializes in educational, technical, and corporate materials. She, also with her in Toronto is Jean McCain, who is a edit, freelance editor specializing in healthcare and medical editing. So they both presented, I think, a, a, a session similar to this at the conference back in June. So I'd like to turn it over to Jean. Thanks, Trish. Uh, and it's great to be here with everybody. Uh, Anne and I really like talking about certification, so we're very excited that there are a bunch of you who want to listen. So that's just great. Um, we're sort of hoping by the end of the hour that you'll you'll have a better sense of what the certification program is like, uh, and uh, you know how how you might want to prepare for it, uh, and consider registering as well. So uh, let me just switch over and get us set up with the slides. Okay, so this is what we want to talk to you a little bit about today. So first we're going to talk about the certification program as a whole and what it's, what it's like. Uh, then get into a little bit about things to think about before you register. Uh, and then Anne's going to talk a lot about preparing for the tests and getting ready to go on test day. And then I'll finish up with a little bit about some tips on, on writing the test. So hopefully we have a lot of material to get through, but uh, I will try not to go too fast, but, uh, but also get through what we've got. So first a little bit about the certification program as a whole. Uh, certification is kind of a, a new development for the editing profession. Uh, and Editors Canada's program is one of the first of its kind in the world. Uh, so we're still working uh, at building a culture, of, a culture of certification and having people understand what it's like. So um, I did want to talk a little bit about the difference between what a certi certificate program is or a training program versus certification because they are actually quite different. Uh, so this table here should help you compare a little bit about what, how, where those differences are. If you take a certificate in, in editing. Um, what that does is demonstrate that you've had education in a particular field and indicates that you've completed a set course or series of courses with a specific focus. Um, getting your certificate involves completing the program requirements and a certificate comes from an educational institution. Certification is a different animal. Uh, what certification does is demonstrate your ability to apply any training and knowledge that you've had. Uh, it's generally aimed at people with some work experience, and it, what it does is indicate your mastery of skills measured against an objective set of standards. Getting a certification involves passing an exam, and it's administered by a professional association. Um, certification also has another aspect to it, which is maintenance of certification, and that is just demonstrating to the association, the accrediting body, that you're keeping up your professional development. So about our program, Editors Canada started talking about certification a long time ago, around the 1980s, uh, and began developing the program in the late 90s and launched it in 2006. So this year actually is our 10th anniversary, which is really exciting. Uh, certification credentials give editors some official recognition of their skills and their knowledge. Uh, and it's aimed at editors of written material who work in English. The program is open to Editors Canada members and non-members. And as we mentioned in the last slides, to earn a credential, you need to pass a test. So some things to think about before you consider registering. First of all, why should you certify? Uh, and that is a question that people need to answer for themselves because it's a very personal one. 
Uh, and there are a thousand reasons to do it, and um, they all depend on your career goals and, um, and your work experience and all kinds of factors that play into it. So it could be that you want to prove your excellence and your skills to yourself. Uh, it could be that you want to demonstrate your skills and abilities to your peers or to clients or employers. Uh, you might want to use it as a way to uh, work um, for professional development and identify some strengths and some gaps in your knowledge. Uh, you might want to see it as a way to set yourself apart from the competition, kind of as a marketing tool. Um, a credential is also something that attests to your professionalism, so uh, that may be a reason for you to certify. Um, beyond personal reasons, uh, there's also the idea that certification is a way of promoting and maintaining high standards of editing for the profession as a whole, um, which is also a really good reason to consider certification. Um, I see there's a question. In our, in the, so the question is, in your experience, what, roughly what percentage of jobs and contracts are available only to certified editors in Canada? So I'm going to answer that live. Um, I would say, I, I don't think there are many that are available only to certified editors at this point. Um, certification isn't mandatory. Uh, and and we're, as I say, we're still building a culture of certification in, in editing. Um, we are tracking lots of clients who put it as kind of a, a preference on their job ads. And, and there are certainly people who are, who are saying putting, having it as a desired um, skill or an, a desired credential, but none of it is, is mandatory. I will add though, that we have at least one member that I know of who got a promotion at work because she has certification, because she uh, was, I guess, promoted to a managing editor position that they had, the company had decided could only go to somebody who was a certified professional editor. So it does happen, but as Jean says, this is just the beginning, and so we don't see the requirement often, but it's really an advantage. And the more people who certify, and the more people who talk about it, the more clients and employers who know, so. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Another thing to think about if you live outside of Canada is that anyone's welcome to take our certification tests. Uh, the benefits are recognized around the world by other editorial organizations like uh, the SFEP and ACES. Um, but you do need to travel to one of the Canadian cities where the tests are offered in order to take it. So that needs to be taken to the um, The other thing to think about if you're from outside of Canada is that the program's designed to test the skills of editors working in Canada. So most of the standards are common to editorial, editorial practices around the world, but the tests themselves may have a little bit of Canadian content. So just to be aware of that and include that in your preparation, um, you don't need to be a member of Editors Canada, as we said, but uh, members do pay lower fees. So back at the beginning, we talked about how certification programs are based in objective sets of standards. And for our program, those are Editors Canada's professional editorial standards. Um, this is a document that's been around for a while and they've been based on years and years of research and review. Uh, and you can think of those standards as a checklist, really. They're very useful for looking um, through what the standards are for a particular type of editing uh, and see you know, how you line up against them. So here's that question. I think we're okay, but thanks. Um, so, uh, to get back to the standards, they, yeah, what they do is outline the knowledge and skills that editors need to have to edit at a minimum professional level with, with very little supervision. So people working quite independently. And they apply to editing in all print media. Also online media, the point is that it's words that are written down. It yes. doesn't just mean words on paper. All right. um, so Jean, if I may uh, mention something. Yes. It, uh, to uh, please stay closer to your microphone, you're cutting out a little bit. Okay. 
My microphones are in my headphones. My best. Okay. I am going to go back and talk about uh, whether people, whether you feel like you're ready. So um, there aren't any formal prerequisites. Uh, there's no kind of checklist that you have to tick off. Uh, but these are not entry level exams. So we strongly recommend that you have about five years experience before you attempt the test, just so that it's not a discouraging experience. That doesn't mean that you have to have kind of five years working in a book publishing house. Uh, but take a look at your own experience, your own background, uh, and its breadth of um, topics, breadth of medium, um, where you've worked, and see how you feel and whether you feel you're at a point where you've gathered enough experience to meet all the standards that we've talked about. So, uh, the certification exams are developed based on professional editorial standards, uh, and they're developed to test them specifically. So it's very important to become familiar with them and know how you measure up against them. And you can download those at editors.ca for free to have a look. So we have a couple of, uh, we actually have three through the afternoon uh, sample questions that we wanted to run by with everybody just uh, as a little way of breaking up the action. Um, so we have them set up as polls, uh, but we had a little bit of a technical difficulty with the first one. So I'm just going to uh, sort of run through this as a slide uh, and I'll talk you through it. And when we get to the next poll question, you'll be able to actually vote and put in your answer. So the sample question we had for this was, for which of the following is permission for use definitely not required? A half page excerpt from a paper in an online journal, a three line poem quoted in its entirety, 10 lines from a 20 line poem quoted in a book review, or two verses of a popular song recorded in the last two years quoted in the resource guide. So that's a typical question that you might find in the first section of the, uh, uh, of the exam. And the answer to that one is C. So the tests, what do they look like? They build on the uh, professional editorial standards. So there are four tests uh, based in the, the different sections of the standards. There's one for structural editing, one for stylistic, one for copy editing, one for proofreading. You can be certified in one of these or more of those. It's your choice. Uh, if you are certified in one, you become a certified whatever, certified copy editor or certified proofreader. To get the full designation certified professional editor or CPE, you need to pass all four of the tests. All tests are the same format. They're three hour open book exams. Uh, so you don't need to measure, memorize the Chicago Manual of Style, you can bring it with you. Uh, you can bring a dictionary, or you need to bring a dictionary, editing Canadian English, and up to three style guides. Uh, and you'll get a list of approved resources after you register. The test format, um, the first section, part A, consists of short answer and multiple choice questions. Uh, and they test your knowledge in the fundamentals of editing, which is section A of the standards, and also in whatever section of the standards the subject of the exam is as well. And that part A is worth about a third of the marks. Part B, which is a, the bulk of the exam, two thirds of the marks, is a scenario and an editing test passage. Uh, so that involves, right now, hard copy markup and may include other tasks such as writing a letter to authors or making up a style sheet. Uh, starting in 2017, the hard copy markup will be turned, will be moving over to computerized testing instead, but for this year, um, it's still on paper and hard copy. Except for proofreading. Except proofreading for will remain on paper for the foreseeable future because at this point, there's no set standard as to how people proofread. Yeah. What technology they use. I need to take a break for some questions. There's many questions. Uh, is there a timeline limit for taking all four exams to receive the full certification? 
Uh, Anne, can you answer that? No. <laughs> there used to be. When, the, when they were first um, uh, introducing, in fact, I think for the first couple of years that the program was running, there was a limit of 10 years. But um, that's been changed. In 2009, the standards that the tests are based on were changed, and a number of other things were changed as well at that time. So no, there is no limit now. There you go. OK. And Diana's asking, is certification lifelong, or does you, do you need to get recertified after a number of years when standards evolve? Uh, I'm going to answer that one live. That they, it's certification is lifelong, but there is maintenance of certification component. So you get your certification and you keep it forever as long as you maintain it. And that involves um, getting a certain number of professional development points over a five year period and submitting a portfolio just to show that you've done that. But it's a fairly simple process and it doesn't take much to add up the points that you need. So um, as long as you maintain it, then your certification is lifelong. If you let it lapse and you want it back, then you have to take the test again. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that one's answered. And there we go. Uh, the other question from Jody is your earlier slide mentioned credential maintenance. Can you elaborate on that? So um, there we go. Uh, I'm going to close this. So, okay. Uh, upcoming tests are in November. We have them every year mid-November. This year's tests are going to be on November 19th with proofreading in the morning and structural editing in the afternoon. Uh, it's always around the same time in November each year. Next year's tests will be copy editing and stylistic editing. And we offer the tests in a number of different cities across Canada. Uh, demand and resources permitting. So we do uh, ask you to uh, give us a couple of your top choices for locations, just in case there's not enough registration in one particular area. Registration opens in July, so registration for this year has been going for a while. Uh, it's still open until the end of October. I think the 29th, is that right, Ann? It's either the 29th or the 23rd. Something like that. But, but it, uh, it's, it's marked, it's on our website is what the closing date is. Yeah. So still open. Your chance is still up. Uh, and then at this point, I'm going to pass stuff over to Anne, who's going to talk to you a little bit about how to prepare for the test. Right. You're still manning the slides, right, Jean? Yes, I am. Okay. So when you're preparing for the test, there are a number of things to think about. You need to have study materials first and foremost. Um, the best thing to do is sit down with the standards. As we said, they are available for free download at editors.ca. They're called professional editorial standards. And do an in-depth review of those and figure out um, how good you are at applying each of those standards. If you're going to be taking the proofreading test, for example, which is offered this year, you would mostly be focusing on part A of the standards, which is the fundamentals of editing, which are common to all types of editing, and part, I think it's part B, which is the proofreading standards, okay? If you're going to be taking the copy editing test, then you're going to be looking mostly at part A, the fundamentals, and part C, the copy editing. Um, B and C I might have wrong because I'm not looking at it right now, but it's the, the standards are divided into five sections, the fundamentals and then each of the four, edit or four areas. Um, the two best materials, or the other best materials besides professional editorial standards is the certification study guide. The study guide contains an example of a test. It, um, it may or may not be um, questions that have actually appeared on tests, but they're very similar to questions that have appeared on tests. And one of the best things to do is take the test. It's timed. It's three hours, just as you would in real life, sit down, take the test, mark the test, and then find out where you did well and where you didn't. And where you didn't, that's when you want to start brushing up on individual skill sets. Jean, could you advance the yeah. slide? Thank you. Um, as I said, you want to look at the professional editorial standards to figure out which ones you need to learn and which ones you need to practice. 
For example, if you're confident in your copy editing abilities and you're taking the copy editing exam, you need to make sure that, oh, it's part D. Copy editing is part D. Um, that you meet uh, the correctness. I'm sorry, I'm not thinking very clearly. Trying to talk to you and read these slides at the same time is more challenging than I expected it would be. Um, Jean, just move the slide. On. Oh, okay. We want to make sure that you that in, in professional editorial standards that you know the differences between Canadian, American, and British style. For example, this is an example of where if you're taking the exam outside of the country, you don't have to be able to edit in all those areas, but you have to at least be familiar with what the differences are. For example, in Canada, First Nations is the correct term for what in America they call Native Americans. Those are the kind of broad things. When Jean mentioned Canadian content, that's the kind of thing. But punctuation and grammar and, and that kind of thing are universal. And so are the various symbols that we use for copy editing and proofreading. And I'm just going to interrupt because we have a question from Jean. Oh, Armstrong, thank which, you. I can't see that very well. Yeah, that's okay. I can mention the questions. Okay. Uh, and it's that is Professional Editorial Standards 2009 the most current version? Uh, and the answer is that as of today, yes, uh, but there's actually a, a revised version that's being voted on tomorrow. And assuming that it gets, uh, assuming it gets passed, then there will be a 2016 version. But we're just waiting to see that. Uh, the 2009 version um, are the ones that apply to this year's tests. So they're based in the 2009 version. Next year's uh, tests will be based on the new ones, assuming they pass. Uh, and we had one other question. If you want to take all four tests, four tests of three hours each is 12 hours of testing. Are they spread over several days? Um, I'll answer that one here, which is that we only offer two tests each year. Uh, and both are offered on the same day, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. But we do have experience that tells us that people who just take one test each year are more likely to pass than people who take two tests in one year. That doesn't mean you can't. I took three tests one year, the very first year that it was offered, and I did pass them all. But the next year, I took just one test, and I failed it. So um, everyone's experience uh, varies. Your mileage may vary. Yes. Uh, one more quick question, and then we'll keep moving on. Uh, Michael's asking, will there be updated study guides to match the updated standards? And the answer to that is yes. We're working on them now and the new study guides for next year's test should be out and about next spring. And okay. even when they are, this year's study guides, the ones we've been using since 2009, are still valuable for studying. Absolutely. Even though the, the uh, standards may change, and they're, I can tell you that they're not changing very much. They're only changing a small amount this time um, if they're approved tomorrow. So the old study guides are still very useful. Okay, so we should keep moving. Okay. Uh, study, oh, did I skip something? Nope, that was it. No, nope, that's good. Okay, so how to use the study guide. Review the beginning of the guide up to the practice test, okay? And then sit down with a timer and write the practice test within the allotted time. It's important to time yourself so that you know that you can complete the actual test within the time limit. One of the problems I had when I did fail a test was because um, the test was handwritten. I was used to working on computer. I hadn't practiced handwriting fast or, or editing fast like that. So what I practiced for the next time was speed, getting up to speed. Compare your answers and the markup to the answer key, review the sample responses, and the study guide includes a, a sample of a passing test and a sample of a test that fails so that you can see what the differences are and figure out what you're good at, and then later in the study period, once you've worked on some of these areas that you identified as being weak, then you can redo the practice test and see how you do. Great. Uh, there are other study materials and resources you can use. We have a, a publication, a set of publications called Meeting Professional Editorial Standards. It's a four volume set. It's mostly self tests and it covers the four competency areas. So you can work through the uh, exercises in those and compare your answers and markup to the samples that are provided. They contain answer keys. And yes, again, later in your study period, redo the exercises. It helps if you're working with a study group because you can motivate one another with this kind of thing. So, Jane, if you want to move the slide, please. 
Oh, Jean's frozen. Jean, can you please move the slide? It looks like we're having a little bit of technical difficulty right now. This is the first time this has happened. Okay, somebody said that they're looking, Jody is looking for a proofreading study group in Ottawa and wants to know if there are any takers. So if there's anyone out here in the Ottawa area who would like to get involved, um, please send an email to Editors Canada and, and, um, and, and say that that's what you'd like to do or in any of the areas and we will try to match you up. Okay, I've lost audio as well. Jessica Gill has asked, will the four volume set also be revised as part of the second revision? I'll answer that live. Yes, it will. But that's not done by the certification steering committee, which we are a part of. That's done by the standards committee, and we don't know right now what their timeline is. Again, the old uh, profession, meeting professional editorial standards volumes are very useful. I still have the old, old ones from before the standards were changed in 2009, and they're still useful too. Even if you never take the test, it's great professional development to work through these guides. Nina says, where does substantive editing fit into EX for categories and what does it include? Again, I'll answer live. Substantive editing is a catch-all term. Um, the, the terminology depend, varies not only from country to country, but from company to company and who you're talking to. Substantive editing is what we generally think of as structural editing. It's how a manuscript is organized. Um, it also could include a bit of stylistic editing. When we first started running these tests, structural and stylistic editing were offered together as one test, and now they've been separated out. But substantive seems to cover both of those areas, but mostly structural. I don't see any other questions, and I'm still locked out. I have no sound. I have no. And you're doing oh. fine. <laughs> Thank you. I'm talking to you. You're doing great. Would you like to do a poll? Yes, thank you. I would because I've got no yes. slides to look at. Okay. So, oops. I guess we've lost Jean, have we? I think so. Uh, can, can you see my poll? Let me share my screen, perhaps. If I could reduce my screen, I'd be able to pull up those same slides because I know how to get to them. All right, so this would be poll number two. Okay, thank you. The poll is when setting a schedule for a publication, this is a sample question that you might see on a test, the kind of question you might see on a test or in a study guide. When setting a schedule for a publication, you must remember that copy editing occurs before proofreading. Copy editing is less important than proofreading. Copy editing occurs after proofreading or copy editing and proofreading take the same amount of time. Okay, so we'll ask you uh, to answer this. So far, most of the questions we've seen are multiple choice. There are also true and answer questions. There's matching questions. There's short answer questions. In this case, uh, copy editing occurs oh, after. Everyone gets to vote. Oh, Dan. I'm so sorry. If, so if everyone would like to make their choice, does everyone see the poll? So please click on the radio button for your answer. Okay. We'll give you a few more seconds to vote. All right, we have a few more people who are still casting their vote. All right, and I think we'll close the poll now. Okay. 
All right. So. So I see most people chose answer C. Copy editing occurs before proofreading, and that is the correct answer. Yeah. I'm glad to see no one said copy editing is less important than proofreading. Contrary to what many clients will say when they phone you and say, I want this proofread, and what they really mean is I want this copy edited. Right. Okay, we have some questions. Pat Curry said, I missed the information about credential maintenance. If time, can you recap or direct as to information on the website? There is information on the certification pages of the website, but basically you have to do prevent uh, certain professional development activities over a five-year period in order to gain points. I think it's 100 points you have to get over a five-year period, and it's very easy to get points. You don't have to do them all uh, all in one year. It's good to spread them out, but if you wanted, you could wait till the last year and do them all at once. We only look at the last five years when we're evaluating whether you've maintained your credential. Trish, can you tell me how I, um, how I bring, how I can minimize this uh, the Zoom window so that I can bring up those slides myself since we've lost Jean. I think just go ahead and, and uh, share, share your desktop. Okay. And then bring them up. Okay, desktop. I can't see very well, so please bear with me for a moment. I'm sorry about this. There you go. Okay. Okay, just a sec. You're going to get to see my cat in a minute. I'm sorry, I have to download them from my server. So everybody gets to see my server. And there's the slides. We'll open those slides. Oops, we're getting the wrong view. I wish Jean would come back. Okay, I'm going to quickly whip through these. We talked about the test format, preparing. Okay. We also have, um, now I'm wondering if my screen is obscured by all the other things that I have open here. No, we, we can see it fine. You can see it? Okay, good, because I see several things. Okay, there's other, other resources that you can use. You can take a, a, a class or a workshop or a seminar from an Editors Canada branch. You can take a university course. If you check the Editors Canada website, you'll be able to see what the upcoming seminars are in areas near you. Each branch does its own individual seminars. And of course, as of this year, we're also doing the webinars, which are useful for anyone anywhere. Uh, go through study books about grammar, punctuation, usage, proofreading, editing and publishing, anything like that. And we do have a list of suggested books on the How to Prepare page at certification, the certification page at our, uh, on, the, on our website, so you can look there. Oops. Um, you can review all the books other study guides that you plan to use during the test and we really recommend this at least one of the study guides study it in depth um, for example the chicago manual has all kinds of information in it and if you familiarize yourself you don't have to memorize the manual you can bring it with you but it's a really good idea to familiar, uh, familiarize yourself with where things are in that book so that when you get to the exam if you need to look it up hi Jean. if you need hi. to look it up you can do so quickly. You don't have to waste time figuring out where in the book it is. And it's really important to refresh your test taking skills. Many of us haven't taken a test in years since university. And it does require certain tests. It includes tips for you know, it's mental preparation, um, review your markup sim symbols for editing and proofreading on paper. If um, you haven't been writing, and most of us haven't, with a pen or pencil for a long time, 
practice writing with a pen or pencil because believe it or not, the muscles in your hands can, uh, it, it requires a lot of muscles that you haven't been using for a while and you can get really tired writing these samples you haven't practiced. That's something I didn't do the first time I took a structural and stylistic editing test and I paid for it. And then there's more information on our website for how to prepare. Okay, you can study alone or you can study with a group. The advantage of studying alone are that um, it, it's more like the real test because during an actual test, you're not collaborating, collaborating with anyone. So time that you spend studying and practicing alone will help you prepare for the real setting. And you can devote the bulk of your time to skills that you know you need to work on. You don't have any scheduling conflicts with other, other people either. Um, studying with others is a great way to go, though. A lot of people really like it. They can help keep one another motivated and on track. You can swap your practice work for review and for marking and share ideas and strategies and uh, share perspectives and the knowledge related to the different fields of editing. Because let's face it, nobody works in everything. It is a good idea to have a good broad-based uh, experience before you do these tests. But if you um, think maybe that you've worked only in one area a lot and not in some of the other areas and you'd like to brush up, working with other people is a great way to get some information about what some of the other areas are like. Finding study partners. Okay, I said send an email. I now see that that was a mistaken piece of information. Post a message to the Editors Canada groups on LinkedIn or Facebook, or send a message out on the Editors Canada listserv. Now, those are only useful to people who are actually members of Editors Canada. So um, there is also the Editorial Editor Association of Earth on Facebook that anyone can belong to, and probably many of you do, and that's another good place where you can uh, post information saying, hey, I'm looking for a study partner. If you're um, near a, where a branch meets, Come to the speaker nights and network and look around the room and talk to people and see who is interested in working with you. And I have a couple questions. Thank you. Uh, one is, do the tests require to use a specific style manual for specific? No. 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 You can bring it, you have to bring a dictionary and you can bring Edit in Canadian English. And then you can have three other style guides of your choice. So whatever you're really familiar with, it can be APA, it can be MLA, it can be um, the Chicago Manual, it can be whatever you are used to using. But you will um, be asked in many cases on a test, if you're having a certain style of question, be asked to indicate what manual you used. Uh, and a follow up then from that, also we can have notes in the margins of our style guide, right? Yes, you can write in it, you can put stick, sticky notes in it, but you can't have any loose papers that could fall out. <laughs> I don't know why, but that's what the rule is. So put sticky notes indicating where certain information is. When I went into one of my tests, I had a sticky note that told me where the metric conversion tables were because I could never find them. So anything that'll help you in the exam like that, yes. Okay, study schedule. Um, time that you need is individual. Certain editors or certified editors agree that cramming won't prepare you properly. Um, Studying a little bit every day, it's just like any skill. Studying a little bit every day gives you enough time to read and practice and review without being stressed by unreasonable or unrealistic demands on your time. The best thing to do is create what we call a work back schedule. So in other words, look at your calendar, look at the date of the exam and work back from there and estimate how long it will take you to complete various exam prep tasks and schedule your time according to how long you think it will take you like that. Okay, we've got another poll question. Trish, do we want to do it the way we did before, or do we just want to? Yes, we'll do it, we'll do it the way we did before. So this is the third one. All right, so I am just going to launch it now. That's the same question. This is an imposition. Is the arrangement of pages on a press sheet? Oh, I don't have the up-to-date version of the slides. Jean, have you got the slides open on your? Yeah, I. Okay, let me. I have to share. Yours. Let me share this. I need. Um, no. I'm sorry. We're having a little trouble for the moment. Okay, so now we should be in with the poll. Thank you.
I see people are voting. This is a true or false question. It says host and panelists can't vote. Well, no. <laughs> Skew the results. While people are voting, I apologize for disappearing. I had a total power outage in my neighborhood. Oh my God. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I found that. <laughs> but uh, of all the times for that to happen. Well, you got back on really fast. That's impressive. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> no, and a better buried... service in Toronto than we have in Vancouver. No, no, it's just a found a laptop. <laughs> and carried on nobly. Thank you, Anne. You're welcome. But it looks like I don't have the most up to date version up to date version. Okay, of I, I, I think what? it might just be the questions. So I okay. don't worry about All that. Right. Okay, I think uh, I think our audience has finished voting. So we're going to end the poll. And here are the results. An imposition is the arrangement of pages on a press sheet as they will be in the proper, or so they will be in the proper order when the sheet is folded after printing, and the answer is true. It is true. So you, most of you got that right. Oops, now I'm okay. way back at the beginning of these slides again. Okay. So you have some slides left. Um, I do, but I have uh, just screwed myself up here. Excuse me a moment. Dean, is this mine showing or yours? It must be yours. Do you want me to take back over? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, tell me. There we go. Mine's gone. So you can... Do you see mine now? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I just need to get to where you were. Which was poll question three. We haven't got that far yet. I went too far. There, we went oh. too far. We do have about, uh, it's about 10 minutes to three. So okay, just, yeah. so we need to hurry through the rest. Yeah. Yep. Okay. We did that. Next slide. Please. Okay. Whoa. <laughs> okay. Something's crazy, but where were you? I just finished poll test. Yeah, but that. We didn't, haven't got that yet. You did practice, practice, practice. No. I think ready to go would be a good place yeah, to start. I think it would. Let's go. All right. Go ahead, and Okay. You have to get together what you're going to do on exam day because the whole point is to minimize your stress levels. So if you get up on exam day and you haven't packed all your stuff and you're running around, you're going to feel really scattered. So we find that um, it's, it's, it's best if you get yourself organized the night before prepare everything ahead of time so that means get together your pens pencils calculator the books you're going to bring put them in a bag by the door um, if you are worried about finding the venue leave lots of travel time or you can even do a dry run the day before especially if it's somewhere you've never been before if you have exam anxiety and a lot of us do you can try relaxation and breathing techniques to help you keep calm Believe it or not, they really work. They get more oxygen to your brain so you can think more clearly. Okay, when you're packing your bags, you know, you're going to take things like we said, like pens, pencils, all of that. But you'll also need a Pica ruler uh, if you have one, a magnifying glass if you have trouble seeing earplugs, if you're bothered by noise, whatever you need to be comfortable. And then the resources that you're allowed to bring. As we said, you can add tabs to the reference books, but you can't have extra pages. And if there's something else that you want to bring that you're not sure whether or allowed, contact the Editors Canada office at least 15 days ahead of time, please. And we have a few questions that um, I think would be good to answer for everybody. So okay. um, if someone has the digital versions of Editing Canadian English in Chicago, mm -hmm. can they bring those? The answer to that would be no, because we haven't, we have no internet access. We're not using computers at this time. Yeah. Even once we start offering computerized tests, you will not be able to have internet access, which you need to access those two resources. So one of the things we are going to have to work out as uh, an organization is how we will accommodate people that have only online versions. It, one of the things we're exploring is the idea of maybe having copies of those resources on the computers when you come in. 
rather than having you access them by the internet like you would from home. Okay, and the other questions, what are the calculator and ruler for? Those are probably m most useful for the proofreading test, um, you know, if you needed to calculate uh, column inches or something like that. Although sometimes you need to convert from metric to imperial. But to, you know, so, so just, or, or vice versa. Yeah, good to have. Yeah. Okay, uh, and would the second edition of editing Canadian English suffice? Uh, I think yes. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Uh, yes. We got a race. Okay, tips and certified. We said pack everything ahead of time, practice editing with a pen and pencil. Make sure you know standard copy editing or proofreading marks and flag the appropriate pages in the Chicago manual. If you're not sure, put a sticky note on the page of the Chicago manual that's got the proofreading marks on it or the copy editing marks. Yeah. yeah. Okay, right okay. I think that's, this is me. Yeah. Uh, so test day. Uh, the the main thing the main thing when you're working on the tests is to have your test taking skills working over time. So you want to be budgeting your time. Uh, take time to read through the whole exam and plan it out so that you know that you're going to spend most of your time on the things that will get you the most marks. Don't do more than what's being asked of you. You know, if you ask you're asked to give three examples. Just give three, don't give five. Um, don't waste a whole lot of time on a question that's worth only a couple of marks. And keep in mind that, again, that part B is worth twice as much as part A. So be sure to kind of plan your time out to, to give yourself enough time to finish. Jean, if I can interrupt for a minute. Somebody asked what part or what, what tests those sample questions were likely to be part of. They can be part of any of the tests because they were part A questions. Part A is, is asking about the fundamentals of editing as well as about specific types of editing. Part B, which I don't think we actually said, is where you actually hands-on edit or proofread a passage. Yeah. Part A is where you answer the short questions. Um, tips for test day. Uh, again, pretty basic. Use things that need, uh, you can, uh, like deep breathing or guided imagery to calm yourself down. Have something to eat. Three hours is a long time and exams are exhausting. So be sure you're not sort of bonking in the middle of the exam. <laughs> Try, if you can, not to use the bathroom because you lose time doing that. Uh, if you're, and again, quickly read through the test, uh, plan your time uh, and, and see how many marks are allotted to each question because each question does have the marks listed beside it. So you can have a look at that. We did pull question three. Okay, and our last thing is um, something that we've been gathering over time from people who've, uh, who've worked on the tests, and these are what we call RDMs, or really dumb mistakes. And again, this comes back to basic test taking skills. So things, things that sometimes happen in the stress of an exam that, uh, that end up costing people marks, and they're really worth avoiding. So one of them is not following the instructions. You know, if you're asked to put your markup in a specific place, make sure to do that. Do what the question asks you to do. Uh, introducing errors, not a great idea. So always kind of check back over your work, make sure you're doing what you need and not making any new mistakes. Uh, m putting your markup on the manuscript pages instead of the exam pages. So, you know, putting your, putting your answers in the wrong place, that has definitely happened and that causes people problems. Uh, another one would be making a style decision and recording it in the style sheet and then not actually following that style when you're doing your, that's, that happens all the time. Uh, one of the things we're testing for is how you interact with, uh, with authors because that's part of the big part of editing. So, you know, when you're doing comments or questions to authors in your sample edit or uh, writing an author letter, uh, be nice, because that's what you need to do in real life. Uh, and the markers are looking for that. Um, th and then the last one is just ambiguous markup. So be really clear in what you're doing and clear in what you're saying on the exam to make life easy for the markers and make it easy for them to give you as many marks as they can, because that's really what they want to do. So that is us. I see we have a couple of questions. The question seemed to be, there's two people asking what's a passing grade. Passing grade is approximately 80%. And you will be told whether you passed or whether you failed. That's all you'll be told. You won't be told what your grade was. 
and you won't be told what you did wrong. That's in line with best practices for certification by international bodies that are certifying for professions around the world. International around the world, sorry. And um, it might vary a little bit from year to year because we have a marking analyst go over the tests and look for things like, for example, if everybody got a question wrong, then obviously there's something wrong with the question and it'll be struck from the test in which case the percentage that you need to achieve to pass might change slightly, but it's usually between 75 and 80%. It's not 50% as I see somebody asking here. Okay. That's measure excellence. So we're looking, we're looking to make sure that you are a master of your craft and that's why this, the, uh, the passing mark is so high. And the idea is to be looking to certify editors who'd be fine to work with minimal supervision. Uh, and an editor who caught half the errors isn't, isn't really in that place yet. So, uh, so that's why we're kind of looking for a higher level of work. Now, any chance of the, uh, us selecting a different month in November for the annual test? I don't think so. We have, a, um, a, not at this point anyway, that hasn't really come up as a question. We, um, we have, uh, it takes about a year to develop a test. So, uh, you know, we have a, a process mapped out and, uh, and it works very well. And um, so I think November is generally it. Um, ladies, there's a question in the chat box. Somebody wants us to go back to the information on practice. Is that the question? Um, no. Um, is there any allowance for people with disabilities? That oh. Does that does not impact practical editing, but does impact test taking, such as the need for uh, a bathroom break or difficulty yeah. printing, et cetera. We've not really had anything come up in the way of um, uh, visual impairment or things like that. But yes, we have accommodated diabetic people who need to eat during the, the test, for example. And um, they have to let the office know ahead of time what their difficulty is and what accommodation they need and then we look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. And if we can accommodate you, we'll do our best to do it. And you're going back to the part on info on pra practice? Oh, somebody wants you, to go back to that? Uh, can you go back to the info on practice? I'm not sure which slide that is. I will look. I'm just, someone asked also for two slides back, so I was doing that. Oh, really doesn't want me to move. So info on practice. Yeah, the one that said practice, practice, practice. It's long after that. I know. It's going backwards. Somebody wanted to see. Uh, these slides, are these, we're making these slides available, aren't we? and also uh, a recording of this session for anybody who wants to see it afterwards. There you are, back up one, there. Okay, the scenario on the test passage being worth two thirds of the mark, that's part B that we mentioned, where you actually have to edit something or proofread something. And then the first section is um, general knowledge about both the fundamentals of editing and also about the area. Somebody asked about what order, uh, what those, those poll questions were, the question that asked about whether copy editing comes before or after proofreading and so on, that's a general question. The question about imposition, that's a general question as well. It's basically understanding how the printing process works. Somebody wanted to look at these, I guess, hey? We have two more. Um, Editors Canada is switching to computerized testing in 2017. When do you think the specifics will be available about that, different computer setup, software, hardware? Uh, well, we can tell you a bit about that already, which is that it's going, I mean, the test will be conducted in Word. Uh, they'll be still conducted in, a, in an exam room, so it'll be in a computer lab, uh, and we'll be using Microsoft Word, the latest version. So, and PCs. Uh, hmm? and, PC. and PCs. So if you aren't used to using a PC, you do need to practice. We tried to find labs where we could have both PCs and Macs across the country, and they really don't exist. Not very many of them anyway, so we decided that we have to go with the platform that most people are using. Yeah. Okay, so we did that one. Uh, can we repeat the passing grade? 
yes, it's about 80%, between 75 and 80%, depending on the test. Um, but it's not lower than that. Okay. And um, I think that's all the questions we've got. Okay, that's great. Good. Thank you so much, everyone. I apologize for dropping out and having a power outage in the middle of our <laughs> webinar. How ridiculous. But uh, thanks to Anne for sticking on. And uh, yeah. Oh, thanks, Jean. Thank you, Trish, for helping us. Yes. And uh, what we'll do all, there will be an evaluation, but instead of uh, giving you the link now, we'll send that to you in an email, okay? So we do want your feedback on the session. Uh, we'll send that link to you in an email, okay? Thanks, everyone, for participating today. Uh, we really appreciate your interest in, our, in the session. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye.